While we try to be as helpful as possible, this podcast should not be considered as professional or financial advice. It contains general information only, and you should seek out professional advice for your own personal circumstances before making any financial decisions. <laughs> wait, 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 we're live. I'm nervous again. We're live. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. I'm Julia. And I'm Nick. And this is The Enthusiast Lab. Yes. Bow, bow, banana. No, that's, that's Banana Boat. Alrighty guys, welcome back to another episode of The Enthusiast Lab. For everyone listening, um, this is our, like, we're back in the pod lab after about a month and a half break. We've had all the episodes coming through um, every week because we pre-recorded so much in August in preparation for our us holiday. to go away yep. to Japan in October. So we haven't been in the pod lab for like yeah, a month and a half, so... Probably going to be stumbling over a whole bunch of words. And yep, until we get back to our ri- uh, r- rhythm. <laughs> until we get back oh, in the rhythm. Right. Should be right. Um, today's episode, we wanted to talk about sight works. And this will be released mm-hmm. as a part one of a part two. Part yep. two will come out next week. Um, because there's so much info in here and we kind of wanted to give it to you guys in bite-sized amounts rather than like an hour and a half episode. Well, yeah, and there's not much info out there about what site works really is everyone has such a mixed opinion about what is actually entailed versus what the builder is actually having to do so we're going to go through it all yeah definitely i think when it comes to building everyone kind of understands you need to find land you kind of have to design a home but no one understands the site works portion of everything of building yeah yeah and the consideration you have to put that into your budget yeah it's, it has to come from somewhere and all a lot of these house and land packages sometimes don't have the right allowance in there so then you can get stuck with a variation or a price increase halfway mm. through. Yeah, well, I mean, site works aren't one of the sexiest features of building a home, no. um, but it is super, super important. Mm. Um, so today we're going to talk about it and we'll be talking about it next week as well, but let's get into it. Yeah, hurry up, Julie. So, <laughs> so what are site works? Essentially, site works are the work required to prepare the land on which the home is being built. Yep. Without your house, uh, without it, your house would not be stable and secure, uh, which means it could cause major damage to the home um, if the land wasn't prepared sufficiently. Um, therefore, no matter which builder you choose to build through, SiteWorks is always going to be in the agenda. They're yeah, absolutely. Always going to be there. Hundred um, percent. And when it comes to site uh, to site SiteWorks, there's no one size fits all. It varies from builder to builder, from land to land, because the each piece of land is so different. Yeah, 100%. Like, you can go into areas where they might be very similar, but you don't know what works has been done on the land for every single one, especially established blocks that have been sitting around for so long. Um, there's, there's a lot to it, and even if you do get the, the same classification, not every builder has the same allowance for it. Some mm. had a bill of that allowance into the base price of the home. Others don't, so then their site works might be a bit more. But so yeah, so there's a lot in there. It can vary. So we're gonna try and go through and try and break it all down so people can have a bit more of an understanding, understand what is actually required by the builder. Um, because a lot of it has to actually be approved by the council with plans mm-hmm. and shit and permits. So, and then some stuff you can do yourself. So, you know, it's just trying to go through it all. Yeah, so I think the first thing that really affects a lot of the other things that kind of, they kind of all intermingle together. Yeah. Um, but the one thing that affects a lot of it is your soil classification. 100%. That's the biggest part. So the soil classification is the type of earth that you are building your home on. Um, the and piece it, of dirt. Correct. Um, and it can have repercussions uh, for your house uh, for like decades after it's been built. Um, and for the course of the home's whole life um if you haven't built it 
correctly per se. Well, yeah, because a lot of the slabs these days are engineered slabs. So you need to have the right reinforcement, the right preparation done on the land first before you pour your slab. Otherwise, you don't do it right. You're going to have fucking issues down the track. Yeah. So what is soil classification? I guess that's the well, first thing. It's the soil being classified for fuck's <laughs> sake. So, <laughs> so basically well, what it does is when you get a piece of land, right, and you're going through the process with a lot of builders, what they're going to do is they take that deposit from you and what they do is they do a engineering, uh, like, like a survey, like a geotech report. So what that is is they take samples from the soil that you're going to be building on and they assess it all to see what's actually in there. You know, they do the boreholes, they suss it all out to see is it just pure, nice, easy sand? Mm -hmm. Is it clay? Is it fucking a mixture of sand and clay? Like there's so many different uh, classifications. And as a rule of thumb, the sandier it is, the less your site works, the less prep work is needed. Mm. The more clay, the more volatile that clay is, which means that, you know, it retains a lot of water and can move a lot more. You're in for a fucking, you're in for a ride for the amount of reinforcement needed for that slab to not move as much. Because slabs and homes you know, settle over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So you want to try and mitigate and reduce that as much as possible by external factors such as the soil and shit. Yeah. Um, and in the building world, um, we would classify your block of land by a letter, which classifies the type of soil. It's yeah, on. the different soils. So for example, um, class A is uh, typically sandy sites with little or, little or no movement uh, due to the change in, in moisture correct so that would be like closer to the beach side um quite well, sandy sides. yeah it depends it depends so definitely going to see that more in the like more beach areas but in perth for example a lot of it is actually quite sandy mm -hmm. whereas in adelaide where uh having this issue at the moment is just fucking clay everywhere yeah very few areas are very sandy and again near the coast but otherwise you're in for a shit show in adelaide mm. whereas in perth you can actually have that better soil a lot more in a lot more further areas when you start getting more into the hills you, you're, you're going to deal with clay a lot more in perth yes in perth yeah. yeah so um i've got a couple letters here that just a generic example so you've got like class a which is your sandy sites class uh, s is your reactive clay sites m is more reactive clay yeah. and then it goes into h1 h2 e all the way down to p and each of Fuck, these i've never heard of those no. because that's just like because you got to remember, guys, a lot of the builders won't touch a lot of real difficult shit. So maybe when you're, you know, in certain areas, more rural, for example, or some smaller builders might take on these more difficult jobs. Most of the project builders and smaller builders that are, you know, trying to focus on what they can do, they'll get to a certain, uh, like, letter or certain classification, and then they'll just go too hard basket. Mm. And they'll just go, sorry, find someone else. And from memory, I think, like, they... Classify it as A, but it, like A one, A two. Yes. So you've got so you've got soil, yeah, which is what land developers sell on. Yeah. Then you have footing details. Uh, okay. So footing details is based on the soil. So for example, the biggest one that gets a lot of people is this A class site, mm -hmm. because there's three different um, footings on there. There is mm -hmm. what's called a D ten footing. Mm -hmm. There is an A footing, and there is a B one footing mm -hmm. and all of them technically fall under the a classification so your perfect world your best you know the easiest to work with is called a class soil d10 footings mm -hmm. you then have a class footings and then your b1 footings mm -hmm. and that covers probably about 60 to 70 percent of perth yep right in adelaide nothing it, it's all clay so you're then up to the next one which is your s class yep. and s Depending on what engineers are assessing it, that can also fluctuate a little bit. But then you've got like, and I'm sure you're going to go through it. But it's like SJ5, 10, 15, 25 or some shit. It just keeps going worse and worse and worse. And then the worst, and then the next one after that would be M. Yeah. And then... M it it stands for moderately reactive clay sites, which may experience moderate levels of ground movement. Yeah. And that's like... For example, because it's all about how much moisture is retained in the soil and shit. That's like mm. you wet the fucking the clay, right? This the soil, and it like holds the water and gets all like murky and shit. Like it's mm. it's pretty fucked up shit. And you then have to think that your home is sitting on this, which is pretty wild. Yeah. 
And how does it stay stable? Exactly. And yeah. without moving. And if you think of a home, like a, it's a flat. Yeah. Kind of well, there's been object. many times in in the years where builders have gone that wrong either from assessments or undercutting shit or got it wrong from developers, all sorts of shit where homes have actually like separated from not having the right slab with the reinforcement put into it. Yeah, it was on the fucking news and shit. I'm not going to go through, but people that do research can find out all sorts of shit. There's all sorts of shit out there. Okay. But yeah, if you don't do it right, big you're, repercussions. you're in for a shit show. Mm. Um, and I'm assuming like we've never dealt with anything other than A, S and M. M, M, M was the hardest mm. um, that we dealt with, and that's in both Perth and Adelaide. Yep. Um, and that's where the builders basically go, look, this is probably a bit fucking how you're going, but we'll we'll give it a shot. And it did well, but then they turned around and said, not again. Yeah. Because <laughs> there was just too much shit on site. They tried to allow for the right things. Things blew out. They covered the cost. A lot of the builders covered the cost during that time. Um, but they're just going, look, there's just not enough money in to try and justify the amount of extra work when we could do four other jobs a bit easier in that same time frame. Mm. Um, the rest of them, I'm assuming, is like the swampier the land, the the more... Yeah, and high, again, it's just, yeah, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot to it, but at the end of the day, um, get that test done mm. ASAP and then figure out which bill is going to work on it and then try and structure through the rest of it. But obviously, the sandier it is, because a lot of people think the sandier it is, the worse it is. It's the complete opposite. Yep. So the sandier it is, the easier it is to compact and get it reinforced. The more clay, the more you're in for a fucking, you're in for a ride. Yeah. Because it's just like, you have to dig some wild fucking footings, mm. like half the size of me and shit. We've got photos of like some of our workers in Adelaide, literally almost the, her entire height, like, look, she's short. Her name's her name's Annie. Love of the beds. Shout out Annie. Shout out Annie. But um, yeah, she's fucking short, and she literally jumped into one, and it was like literally at her neck. Yeah. And like that's just the same we have to put just so then we can put the Rio in there, and the Rio was like fucking half the size of my hand, mm. like the big boy thickness, like, and that whole thing is just covered in fucking steel, mm -hmm. and then pull the slab in to try and keep that thing from moving. Yeah. And that's just a generic four by two home. Yep. And that's. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it just gets worse and worse. You have to build sand pads and all sorts of shit. So, anyways, we were diverting from shit, but... Uh, what, what I was going to say is... Full on. A lot of developers um, do uh, build up their land to try and make it as close to A as possible, if not A. Yes. Um, and I think what you need to realise is you might find a block that's a lot cheaper um, and this might be a factoring reason as to why. Yeah, there's um, a couple there's a couple things in there, so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll quickly touch on it. But we will bring some land developers in to give mm -hmm. us their point of view. So, a lot of the developers, what they like to do is the more work they can do and sort shit out. Obviously, they can try and sell it for a bit more of a profit because it becomes easier. So then the builders will take it on and then move it through the process. Whereas you look at a lot of private sale blocks, normally you don't have landscaping, you don't have fencing. This is for Perth mainly. Um, and then you've got to do a lot of retaining and reinforcement shit like that. So what happens is with the developers, they'll get these big parts of land, they'll figure out what it looks like, and then they'll go, cool, you know what? We're going to start smashing tons of sand, dig a lot of the shit out, and actually spend the, the money to develop the blocks, which in return does mean that they are a bit more expensive in these estates mm. versus in you know a private sale block somewhere that has already been established area. But in return you know that potentially your site works is going to be a little bit less. So even though you've got a cheaper block somewhere else, your site works might be higher mm -hmm. versus somewhere where the land might be higher, but in return, your site works is lower. So they're almost the same, same, like give or take a couple grand. Mm. So uh, me personally, I'd rather someone else deal with the limestone, the retaining, the all that shit to know that, you know, if they've spent some good coin on it yeah, and then go from there. So now that we kind of have a at least a bit of a gist on what soil classification is, because that plays such a huge role. Yes. We're going to cover in the next episode, bushfire, noise and coastal. But in this episode, I wanted to talk about all the smaller items, not so small, but small items that people might not realize is kind of part of um, site works. Okay. So we're going to go, so we know about soil. Yep. So now we'll go over site works. What the fuck is actually site works yep. and what does that entail? And why is it so important with a house loan package? Yes. So the first thing I wanted to know is site works can either be provisional or fixed. Correct. And we did mention this in was episodes... Was two or three or yeah, something? Like yeah, like two or three. 
Um, and I thought we'll kind of rehash that information and then kind of dive into all the other bits. Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, it ain't going to be no 20-minute fucking episode, Julia. Well, we'll see. Um, so, provisional or fixed, why? Okay, so... What does it mean? So, provisional means that it's a provisional sum. Mm-hmm. That means that there's been a provisional sum allowed for certain items for the site works. Yep. Whereas a fixed site works means that the there is an, they basically come up with a figure that is fixed, that it won't fluctuate, and, they, and the builders will base this on the footings mm-hmm. that we just spoke about. So... You got to figure out what the class is of the soil, then what the footings is, and that's what the builder will, will fix it on. Now, when your result comes back, if that um, the actual footing detail is not correct, the builder can hit you with a price increase for that fixed site works mm-hmm. to reflect what has actually come back from the result. So mm-hmm. you got to make sure they they know their shit, right? In the provisional, same thing. If they've allowed 15 grand for your site works, for example, that's for a combination of everything, which we can go over now. And whereas someone that's fixed might be 18 grand. So you've got to look at why is one a bit lower, why is one a bit higher if they're both working on the same. The builder, and I'll say this right on the record, the builder will never give you something that is going to be fixed without knowing that there's going to be some sort of positive in their end in the long run. Mm. Because... If they fixed everything and it was always going to be, you know, and it's going to cost them money, well, then you, how the fuck is that a good sustainable business It's not idea? a business model. No. So what ends up happening is, <clears throat> sorry, guys. So what will happen is with the fixed site works, they'll have certain components that is included in the fixed site works. And sometimes regardless if it's needed or not in that, in that on your specific block, over time they might, you know, not have to, you know, cover on certain items. So they get a little bit back from it, but the fixed price is still the fixed price. Mm-hmm. Whereas provisional, it may go up or it may go down. Yeah, so you're kind of rolling the dice on a provisional sum versus correct being a fixed. Safe. At least you know where the fuck you're at. Yeah, you're being yeah. safe with fixed. So yeah. if hard digging comes up, you're not going to be charged for it. So again, in fixed. So if like they find if it's in their clause, because they have a whole annexure, like a two-page document explaining what is included and what's not included. Mm-hmm. So I go through that with all our clients because we have fixed site works in both uh, Perth and Adelaide. Yep. And we go through what is included, what's not included, what's applicable to the block because I go through, like obviously I do the whole thing. Yep. And if there isn't, if there is something that's in there that's not included, we normally go back to the site works and show why I've allowed for it mm-hmm. and make sure that we cover all the bases. Yeah. So okay. always make sure to read all the annexes, especially when it comes to something fixed. Mm. So the next stuff that is kind of included in SiteWorks is your council fees. Yep. Good chat. <laughs> <laughs> so council fees, there's different councils have different fees for what it is for application, um, application fees, the council fees, the per- building permit fees. So that's when it comes to like all the shit, you know, if, you, if they have to go to planning, that's, mm-hmm. that's additional fees and shit that they need to take into consideration, which... They, you normally assess in the initial stages once you've done what the zoning is on the block, what's what design you're doing, are you pushing the limits on what's actually allowed. So this is where all of these things will come into play if there is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got bonds. Yeah, yeah, so bonds. So you've got your bonds like your shire bonds, you've got crossover bonds. Um, so these are all just additional things that might need to be paid up front and then later down the build they can actually chase that money back as like a refund from the council if it's not required but it's just initial bonds it's basically everyone trying to fucking take take a little bit of a portion of their money yeah so we've actually got um like curb deposit and shit like crossover that crossover and curb as the next two yeah. so a bond for a uh crossover so for example you've got your footpath yeah. Oh, sorry, that's not your crossover, but no. you've, you've got your footpath. <laughs> no, um, sorry, no. I'm, I'm looking at the wrong sentence, curb slash footpath repair. So you've got your um, footpath and because so much heavy machinery comes onto the block Correct. to build the home, yes. if the machinery damages the uh, footpath, that's what those bonds are there for. But if it's not damaged by the machinery, then it's not used and that's when the builder will start chasing that money back up. Yeah, because it comes down to the responsibility of the owner, which is the client, mm. right? So what happens is the biggest thing that I normally recommend and what the builder normally does is when they start the process and the progress, they'll normally go out on site and take a photo of the footpath. They'll take a photo of the existing curb as it is 
to note if there's any cracks or anything like that. Then during the entire build, because you, you got to remember as, as a client, even if it's not your own machinery from the builder, if someone else damages it while it's during that building period, you're still liable for it. Mm-hmm. So what normally happens by the end of the build, uh, they're doing the final inspections, about to do it all, and that's when they normally suss down and go, cool, look, there are a couple cracks. Let's rip the fucker out and redo the curb. And that's why those allowances get, get uh, used. Yep. But always, you, you can tell within a mile once, once it's been redone. So if you look at your place and you realize it hasn't been done, but you have an allowance for it, query the bill and go, hey, can you please provide proof, proof that you've redone it? If not, I want the money back. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that kind of covered the Curb and footpath. Two. Curb and footpath. Correct. And then the next one would be crossover. Crossover. So basically what is cross- crossover is the first part, mm-hmm. which is a crossover is the basically the piece of land that is from the edge of your driveway to to the main road, yep. right? So that that gap there, that is council land. That's your that's your council crossover. Mm-hmm. So, what we do with a lot of the builds um, is we actually extend the paving. So, for example, if your driveway has paving, we actually put an allowance in and actually complete the paving all the way to the end, so that your entire driveway from this from the from the road all the way back to your garage is covered. Yep. And this is something that a lot of builders especially a lot of first-time builders, I've noticed that um, they'll remove that allowance to get the cost down. Mm. At the end of the day, man, that means you're going to be rocking up and it's just going to be a piece of fucking sand and then pavers afterwards. So yeah, you're going to have that divot. Yeah, you're going to have a divot. You're going you're to have a fucking shit time. Now, you also got to remember in some areas like councils, they actually want you to put what's called sub-base underneath that council land because of machinery and shit like that. So, or like heavier trucks and stuff like that. Otherwise, you'll div, like, it'll dip pretty mm-hmm. quickly with yep. like obviously traffic so what ends up happening is if you're doing the the council crossover uh, that crossover section you need to do according to the council specs mm-hmm. you've got to make sure that you're fitting within the you know the apron you've got to make sure that you've got the right materials in there and normally you have to take photos and they normally get inspected by the um council. the council yep. um, because they normally tend to give you a bit of a refund so sometimes with the fixed site works you actually can't claim it because it goes to the builder to mm-hmm. help compensate but sometimes with the provisional you can do so there's always something to think about much of a muchness yeah um but next- yeah that's that that's that difference it's a very vital one that you need to make sure that you cover yep otherwise you're in for a shit show the next thing included is your boundary wall detail cool so boundary wall detail that really comes into play when we're talking about building the garages on the boundary So when the garages go on the boundary, that becomes your fence line. So Mm -hmm. what normally happens is there's going to need to be a little bit more reinforcement and a bit more engineering, basically to make sure that that garage wall is going to be sturdy and and to be able to sustain everything because that's your fence line. There's no longer a fence that you're leaning on. So that boundary wall detail, that's what it's for. So when you're right up on it, which is called a zero lot wall, Mm -hmm. that's when you have the high allowance in there, which for normal double garage, rough numbers we want to throw out there about two grand Mm -hmm. about two two one if you're 500 uh, millimeters so half a meter off that boundary you still need the boundary wall detail but it's a lot less because it's a little bit less risky Mm -hmm. so it's almost like half the price yep uh once you're a meter off that boundary you no longer have that boundary wall detail Mm -hmm. that you don't need to cover um so that's where that comes into play but again some uh, floor plans, especially real small ones like the six meters, seven and a half, and some ten meter plans, with, especially with our builds, uh, they've already got them included in the base price, yep. so you don't need them in the counts in the site, site works. works. So just make sure when you do see and you've got those smaller plans where you see you're on the boundary, ask the question, mm. like, is this included? Do I need to take this into consideration now because it is some extra costs? Yep. Uh, the next thing that is included is area loading. Area loading. So we're not getting that anymore at the moment. Well, especially not with who we've aligned with nah, builder wise. Nah. But it was something that we had to have a conversation with yeah, originally. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because obviously, the way it works with area loading, so it happens for multiple uh, multitude of reasons. The main one is normally trying to secure trades to travel out to your site. So when you're outside of the normal metro. Um, and if the builders don't have a lot of trades and they're really relying on specific ones, they might have to try and, you know, give them that little bit of extra to persuade them to actually go out mm-hmm. to your site if it's a bit further away from what they're comfortable to do. So that's a big one. Sometimes it's about delivery. So if they go out to specific areas, 
the actual suppliers might charge more for their for shipping deliveries. So mm-hmm. that's where that allowance of of um, area was area loading yep. uh, comes into play. Um, your, your main two is going to be suppliers and that. Sometimes just the builder as well going, look, if we need to go out there, we have to spend more fuel, uh, more time for the supervisors, more for everything. So that's why they put a small portion in there. Normally, I've seen that over the years. Normally, it's about 1.5% based mm-hmm. on the contract value of what the home is. Yep. So, you know, 200, 300K, expecting we'll be paying about three, four and a half grand. Yeah, and I wanted to say, th- the example I've got in my head, and it's we're not charged area loading with the Vita, who no. we're building with, because we've got so much business there, so they don't need to put area loading. No, because they've got the whole fucking two bars just doing those one, one area. Correct. So the two areas that come to mind for me is Ravenswood yep. and Bullsbrook. In, in Perth. In yep. Perth, yeah. Yep. So because we do so much business in those two areas, we don't have area loading. But it was a conversation that we've had in the past with previous builders and even Absolutely. a conversation we had with Levita yep. where they said... Um, we're, not, know, we're not 100% sure we might, depending on how much work there is, because they only had like one or two back then. Mm. And then by the time we got there, I think there's about 30 of them now. Yeah. All happening at the same time. So, and that's the thing is, look, you got to make it worthwhile for everyone, right? Mm. That's how it always works. So if you've got one or two in a certain area that's a little bit on that outlier, then yeah, maybe there might be a little bit. But then if you've got 5, 10, 15 of them, then it's actually worthwhile for them to go, look, we actually might need to get someone just to do that because that takes a lot of time. Yep. And that's what happened, you know. I remember the very first conversation back then with like Levada and stuff. It's like, hey, we're not sure about these other areas. I'm like, well, we've got fucking volume, so let's have a conversation. That's where so much of our business goes. And now they've literally, because of the amount of volume we're doing these specific areas, they've literally got a supervisor just for those areas. Yep. It's fucking sick because everyone gets to sort themselves out, but it's a full-time gig basically. Yep. Dealing with only like two fucking different, you know, suburbs. So... That's what happens with a lot of the outliers. And guys, if you're going to more like rural areas, like, you know, a bit more further out, you are going to most likely get hit with this with some of these other companies because it's just trying to secure the trades. And man, like right now we're in what? We're in October. Well, fuck no, we're in November now in 2023. Mm-hmm. There's still so many trades right now that are sitting there and going, I don't want to fucking travel more than 10 minutes because yep. there's so much work out there. Yeah. Like the boys are fucking slaving away. They're busting holes. So they're just cherry picking. So sometimes this is why, you know, people have had to be hit with it. But always compare it because you'll see like some builders won't have it for certain suburbs and then some will. So you just got to query and go, what the fuck, why? Yep. So the next one I've got is site preparation. Yep. Yep. So that's basically like all the compaction, um, just surveying all that type of shit. Like just basically just getting it all. Block. Yeah. You just... Prepping the block. Make sure that everything's fucking mint. Uh, the next one is survey repeg. Yep. So that's repegging. So sometimes when when the blocks first get done, um, obviously they have all the, the pegs in there, the survey pegs, but sometimes they get knocked around with machinery and shit like that. So in case it's needed, it will get repegged and resurveyed to, to make sure that we're actually building within your fucking building zone. Yep. The last thing you need... It's a building on your neighbor's fucking property. Yeah, exactly. That's a fucking, yeah. That's a nightmare. Yeah. So the last four, uh, I've got footings, which now now that we know site Comes classification, yes. um, this one makes a little bit more sense. And you kind of touched up on it. So let's go a yep. little bit more in detail on footings. So footings is the is a very important part. This is probably the part that fluctuates the most uh, depending on, on your site works because it's based on the soil and then what requirements are needed for the engineering spec for your for your slab because each most of the slabs i can't say every slab because there are builders that will just do a generic 100 mil slab and Mm -hmm. that's it most slabs and all of ours are engineered Mm -hmm. so they're engineered based on the footing detail that is done by the assessment on your block yep so initially it might be only 85 mil that's needed then it might be 100 or it might be 120 with xxx amount of Rio. So the fulling side, what it really comes into play is how much prep work is needed for the slab to ensure that it doesn't, you know, that it has minimal to no movement. Yep. So you will notice this when when you're going to site, if you can catch it, because it happens very quickly. And when your earthworks is complete, where they've compacted it, they've done the little cutouts, then your fullings comes into play. And that's when you'll see 
the outside of the home, a lot of the areas where it will get all dug out, mm -hmm. and that's when they'll be pulling down all that Rio, which is your steel, you know, a lot of the steel mesh and all that reinforcement. So that is the part where, as the as the uh, soil gets worse, that's you know the the engineering requirements, the amount of labor, the amount of material that's needed, because it's not just like one type of steel. There is like fucking 15 different specs of mm. it and it gets more expensive and more expensive the higher the grade of the steel and and the deeper needed. the footings go exactly so obviously you want to try and find blocks that are on the much more nicer sandier side mm -hmm. to reduce these costs but otherwise the more expensive they get this is why yep so uh, hopefully that gives a bit of an idea yeah and the next one that we've got is hard digging hard digging so hard digging that that can come into play even in sandy sites. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because when you go into sandy sites, you normally you might experience some what's called limestone refusal. Mm -hmm. So even though it's sandy, sometimes there's portions of limestone. So they might need to bring a hard digger out just to dig out that little bit because it's not very you know easy soft sand. So, it, or when you're going into clay, you tend to need to use one because fucking a normal shovel is just ain't gonna do it unless no. you're gonna spend like three fucking days doing it. And a lot of these boys need to get shit done. Yep. So that's where hard diggers come into play. So hard diggers really come in when required. And if done, then there's normally an allowance for that. Or if not, you normally get stung with it when they go to site. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely something to consider. And the best way to look into it is looking at that engineering report. If you get a copy as a client, if not, making sure that your consultant, whether it's us or someone else, make sure that they know their shit. You can tell within a mile away when you're going somewhere what you're going to be dealing with. Mm -hmm. And you sometimes, like what I do, better be safe than sorry, charge it up front. If it's not needed, you get the money back. Yep. Rather than the other way around and you're sitting there scrabbling for, you know, another thousand, fifteen hundred bucks potentially, if not more, mm -hmm. because of the fucking something that got missed. Yep. Uh, and then last two, so soak wells. Super, oh, okay. super important. You said this was the last one. All right. No. So <laughs> no, fine. So with soak wells, so Basically, the soak wells, the ones that are used with building, um, they are normally the two big massive, normally two, sometimes three or four. They're massive, like, fucking concrete motherfuckers, right? They're concrete cylinders yeah. with little with holes With little holes design. everywhere. So what happens is that helps to distribute a lot of the water that comes out, like, that gets collected from your gullers and shit, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is rain happens, water goes down on the roof, yes. goes through the gullers, down into the downpipes, these down pipes are then connected to PVC pipes mm -hmm. and they are then connected up to these soak wells, which mm -hmm. are in the soil. Yep. Now, depending on how big the block is and what normally gets done, normally there's like one on the front, one in the back, mm -hmm. right? One like under the driveway type of thing and then one at the back or two at the back. And what happens is these systems, they allow for the water to accrue and d basically dissipate through the soil to make sure that it's not retaining that water. And... As the site works, you know, the, sorry, the soil classification gets worse, the more complicated that system needs to be to be able to handle and distribute that water because it's going to get retained by that soil as it gets more clay and more worse. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the sand, it's just fucking, this is the size concrete ones and that's what it is. Now, correct, you know, if someone out there wants to try and correct me on this, by all means, but about fucking, it was about two years ago, maybe three, um, a lot of the times, builders would actually try and reduce the costs of um, like with soak wells mm -hmm. by allowing the clients to do it yep. during the build. And a lot of sometimes people try to do it the cheap way by going to Bunnings and getting little plastic ones and fucking digging them out individually and trying to do it rather than doing like two big fuck off ones. Mm -hmm. And there has been some issues over the years, and there was a regulation that came in with a lot of the councils where they turned around and said, we're not accepting it. We will not issue build permits now unless the circles are, the included. are included or done by the by the builder. So that's where you'll start to see now that a lot of the builders are including these. And you'll notice them straight away when you go on site, especially straight after slab going down. Yep. You'll normally see them get delivered. They have to get craned off the fucking truck. Mm -hmm. Like you ain't fucking moving them yourself. And then... Yeah, basically, the boy, the boys get it done in like half a day. Mm. Literally just fucking dig it all out, dig all the fucking pipe, where all the pipes are going to go, smash these in, close it up, happy days. Mm -hmm. Fucking never have to see it again. Um, but they're like big, big concrete. Yeah, like this. big concrete cylinders. Yeah. And the last one is earthworks. Yeah, so earthworks, 
Earthworks is probably the one that everyone sees the most. Yep. Um, and sometimes people mix up Earthworks with Siteworks. Yep. So Siteworks is the entire thing. Earthworks is just a component. And the Earthworks is basically getting that, that site prepped, the compaction, getting, you know, if sand needs to be delivered and all that shit. This is where a lot of that comes into play. Um, Shrubs removed, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like all that type of shit. So, you know, if you've got sand, just a sa- nice sandy site, then, you know, that Earthworks portion will be a lot less because it's less to prepare because mm-hmm. it's a flat level block. If it's not level, then, you know, you need more Earthworks because you need more soil out there and more preparation getting done. So it all kind of, they all merge within each other. Mm-hmm. Um, the main two things that a lot of people need to understand and consider is the earthworks and the footings. Mm-hmm. That is the biggest part that contributes to the cost of your site works. The third one would be your soak wells, yep. your concrete soak wells, because they have, they're normally done with engineering drawings based on the size of your roof layout. So the bigger the house, the bigger the roof, the more potential um, soak wells you may need. Sometimes you need two or three. We'd, we had to do one that had six. Mm. Big fuck off house <laughs> with a big fuck off garage. But at the same time, you got to be able to sustain because the roof area was so enormous that they had they sat there and went shit we need to do a fucking pretty complex system for it so it costs a lot more than it would normally mm-hmm. these are the things you need to consider and then all the little bits and bobs okay so let me try and do a summary of that well you can do a summary <laughs> without me fucking sitting for like 30 minutes <laughs> explaining it all so fucking running out of breath here site works uh i'll repeat myself here site works is uh, the work required to prepare the land on which your home is being built. Yes. And the main thing that, or the first thing that you should really be considering when it comes to choosing your land is the soil classification. Yes. And you are seeking the more sandier site and you are trying to avoid the clay sites because they are much yes. more difficult to build on because the home needs to be stable. Yeah. So you want something that's sandy. Yes. But also level. Yes. Flat level. The more slopey it is, the more it's going to cost you in the back end with earthworks and shit. So yeah. flat level blocks that are more sandy is your primo. Perfect. And then after that, um, the things that are included in your site works are, and I'm going to list them out here, your yep. council fees, your bonds, your curb slash foot pa- uh, footpath repair, your crossover, your boundary wall detail, your area loading, your site preparation, your survey repeg, the footings, which is based on the site classifications, and yes. your soak wells, which are also based on your site classification, and hard digging, which is also based on your site classification. And lastly, earthworks. Mm-hmm. There's also the, the three mains that we'll touch over. I was just going to say, okay, hold go, on. Go on. And in the next episode, uh, what we're going to be cl- uh, talking about is your noise, your bushfire, and your coastal, which are three things on top of everything that we just listed that you need yes. to consider. Yeah. Um, But we'll be covering that in the next episode. I should have said this at the beginning, but if you wanted to listen to them side by side, wait till next week. But (laughs) it's a little late to say that Yes, but so so (laughs) in case people actually get caught out, so we'll cover in a separate one because it's going to like, we've got a bit of detail to go through. Mm. But in your site works and when you're choosing the land, you may have some of these, these main three. And you need to keep this in consideration that this is the time when they'll be having to upgrade the house and cost it into your home when they present the quote. And that's in your site works. So the three that ju- that we're going to go over with Julia is what's called bow, bushfire attack level, noise or noise attenuation, and then coastal, coastal attenuation, basically. Mm-hmm. So coastal, we'll go through. Coastal, no, no I'm just saying as a rough. <laughs> Relax, Julia. Coastal is when you're near like a, you know, a main, main body of water, mm-hmm. like fresh water, you know, the, or the ocean sea. or the sea or whatever. Noise is if you're within a flight path or fucking near freeways and shit like that. Something that's got continuous loud noise. And bowel is if you're near an area where you might be affected of a bushfire. All right. So we're going to go into those three in a little bit more detail on the next episode. Yep. I hope that summary made a little bit of sense and I hope this episode made sense because there's so much information that we're trying to cram in a 40, 45 minute episode. And we used to do this in like one minute segments. No wonder why there was like 50 of them. (laughs) Fuck. So um, I hope that gives you guys a little bit more explanation, a little bit more understanding of what SiteWorks are and what's included in SiteWorks. Um, if you guys could leave a rating or a review, that would be fantastic. Hit that follow button because it really does help us. Subscribe, subscribe, help us out. Back end. Thank you, Nick. No worries. Um, and let's plug, plug, plug. You can find Mr. Enthusiast on... Facebook, Insta, 
uh, TikTok, website, Google, Apple Podcast, uh, Spotify, and YouTube. Perfect. Um, and just remember, guys, we're not here to fuck spoilers. Bye. Bye.